Beep boop interruption. Music. Music. <laughs> <laughs> Beep boop interruption music. Hey, heads up. Everybody who's supporting the show by Friday, December 21st will be able to have their name as a character in the upcoming sci-fi adventure show to Cypher RPG. So hey, if you're thinking about supporting the show, now would be a good time. Decipher sci-fi.com to support the show. Now some anime. Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to Cypher Sci-Fi, Explore How Why. Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. Jolene's here. Hello, everyone. I am Jolene, the science queen, science writer queen, something like that. I try. Good. You gotta, you gotta work on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we watched a movie. We did. We watched Akira, the anime that came out in 1988. Spoiler alert. We're going to spoil the movie. What is Akira about, Jolene? Uh, well, it's a really confusing movie because <laughs> yes. there's a lot of stuff going on. But ultimately, we think it's about this strange space energy slash strange space possibly god that comes and creates a bunch of psychics on earth and frivolity ensues <laughs> jolene do you remember your first exposure to akira i'm asking expecting it to have been in the early 90s or late 80s i act i have no idea at all um if i did encounter it which i'm sure i did i didn't recognize that that's what it was because i only watched it for the first time recently so i wouldn't have gotten any of the references before four days ago oh you missed out yeah, no, I hadn't watched it before. I was uh, three when it came out. Well, I don't think any of us really watched it when it came out. You're old. You did too. Don't lie. Not quite that old, but early 90s was when this came into my life, and it was probably my main introduction to anime. Yeah? I would have seen it over your house. I was going to say, now yeah. that I'm thinking about it, we might have actually seen it together <laughs> for the first time. The thing about this movie is that it is like a super important touchstone culturally and in like sci-fi circles and the whole thing. And uh, I think a lot of what you'd get, a lot of what gives it that is the context of when it came out and the way it felt for everyone when it did. So I'm sorry you missed that, but lucky for you, it still is just gorgeous. In fact, it's probably a lot better because when we would have seen it, it would have been on a crappy copy VHS and you got to see it in 1080 or whatever. It did. Yeah, the budget for it, I believe, was like $9 million, which I have no idea what it costs to make movies nowadays or what their budgets are. But at the time, it was the most um, expensive anime budget ever. Or sorry, yeah, m the most expensive animated movie ever made. I think it stayed that way for a long time. That's part of why it looks so good. I mean, the art is wonderful, but they spent so much money and had an incredibly high frame rate that everything just looks like butter and it still looks awesome. This was the deal in the late 80s, early 90s, and Akira was was actually very successful in the West. And part of why we remember it now, I think, is just that it was the thing that brought anime to the attention of the West in a way that wasn't Speed Racer and Astro Boy or whatever. How common was it at the time to have movies actually be translated? I have no idea. So it's a genuine question. I have no idea either. I know that it's as a normal child at the time growing up, I didn't see that sort of thing. I mean, it seems like they're wouldn't have been that many. It's still not super, super common for movies to get translated into English, at least not. I mean, all the mainstream movies that we see are originally in English and generally come from Hollywood. I feel like the United States, like we don't tend to watch many movies in oh, other languages. I think I understand what you're saying now. You mean in general, things that are not in English, period, because that's probably true. But the one place where it isn't, I think, is anime. Yeah, I would I would say pre-internet Ability for people just to sub things and be like, I really enjoy this. Let's find random people to translate and make subs of our own. It would have to be probably very well known beforehand to reach out to generate that. I think the thing is just the market didn't exist to this degree yet. Especially there there might have been like, like I said, it was Speed Racer and Astro Boy. But this was adult. That's what's really special here is in the late 80s, early 90s, when you see this for the first time, your mind is blown because you think you're getting a cartoon. You've never seen something this violent and dynamic and huge at that time. I think this established that market for anime in the West. It's also just not adult. It is so adult. Like there's uh, attempted rape, uh, sexual assault, and 
people getting dismembered and squished. And it's a little bit like Quentin Tarantino, I guess, except, you know, not as ridiculous and absurd. Yeah. And that's with some of the ultraviolence and the drug use that was in the manga taken out for the movie. And so you saw this, I think we saw it in the same place. We both watched it on Hulu in the modern age, like in HD 1080 on a television. And we watched the English dub. Jolene, what did you watch? I also watched the English dub, which is good because, well, I guess it could have also made for an interesting conversation if you had done the subs because we could have been watching, for all intents and purposes, a completely different movie. There is room for that, for sure. Something I've done before, I don't make a habit of it necessarily, is to like watch the dub and then also have the subtitles on to get both angles. Because oftentimes, different people completely are translating or localizing the script from the one into both of these other formats. There is a distinction between, in general, between translation and localization. Like, the, the, it's not just translate this script. Sure. It's make it applicable. How much of language are is, is context and idioms? You know, exactly. My, uh, my background is in the, you know, English and rhetoric and all of that stuff. So I've taken a lot of classes and had a lot of debates with people on what, what do you do when you translate a work or how do you translate a work, you know, air quotes correctly. Do you translate it literally or do you translate the substance of, of what is being said? And if you are translating the substance of what is being said, how do you as the translator decide what that substance, what those key points are that need to be translated? Uh, it's, it's a really, really complex and difficult job when it comes to literature and and movies and things that contain such complex ideas and metaphors almost any media has the same issue really and it can get even more complex and for context like you're coming at it from like the english literature angle there are people who do some video games that have a very different job there are people who do this in the case of movies that might have a very different job and then it has another whole meaning in software where localization as opposed to just translation because there's not just the strings of text but there's the context of how that appears in the ui and how it works entirely could be different like you know arabic goes right to left type situation where in that case, the, the text is the one thing you're translating, but localization refers to the entire process of making it work in a way that is intuitive and native to a person in a place and a culture. And that still just applies to the movies, right? Because it's not just the words, it's the idioms and the meaning conveyed by the words more than the literal. Then there's also the facial expressions and, you know, intonations and things like that that come into play. And you and I came up, like, I'm not a big anime nerd. And you weren't either? You were the one who introduced me to it. Yeah, but you didn't have... Okay, like I was a little bit. But like not that much. <laughs> I don't think unless you had a secret anime life. Because what we had to do back in the day, thank you internet, was actually like wait for other people online to do translations. And I think translations is the right word, not really localizations. Because they would, you would wind up getting this fan subs, as we're called. I think they still exist, but it doesn't make sense because Crunchyroll has things out the next day with actual translations. Yeah, but they still release them within hours now. I Do think. they? So, yeah, sure. Why well, Go for it. But it, the fan sub thing would be like, you'd have to go online to get the show and then get the subtitles for the show. And those subtitles would be like all kinds of language and culture notes on the screen along with the subtitles. It was actually like really good. I've never seen that before. That sounds really interesting. You didn't download enough anime in the 90s, <laughs> I guess. I... Jeepers Creepers, I didn't even have a computer. I was on dial-up to download one song off of Napster. It took about 45 minutes. Gross. Uh, how are you downloading movies? My goodness, you high fluting folks, aren't you? This would have been 1997 or 8 type style? Well, you had cable early on. Right? I lived out in the boonies. And you speak about localization. So there's the cultural context as well. One of the things that's really interesting about the culture is I just got back from Japan. I was there for about two months, mostly in Tokyo, but traveled around to Osaka and Kyoto and a bunch of other places. That's my entire experience with Japan. So I am by no means an expert in any way on the culture. Uh, but looking at how violent and dark and dystopian everything is in this movie and all the the fights and the gangs and everything like that comparing it with what you see in tokyo today which is this very pristine very clean um city that has an amazing infrastructure um and you know the, the fears about 
tyranny and military takeover and all of that stuff just are if they are there, they are very much beneath the surface and not something that I think are, are felt on a, a conscious level, at least certainly not if you are there um, as a foreigner in any non, you know, traditional capacity. Think about when the movie came out, though, in terms of, well, I guess not just in terms of this film, but in terms of the anime industry at the time, because post-World War II, Japanese, the Japanese had some stuff to deal with. Yeah. And we've had like a longer conversation about the idea of like the cultural after effects of the world, the world war and the bomb on like our Godzilla episode and preoccupations with like nuclear destruction, that sort of thing. But you can see that there's like some of that mixed in to the influences that created this movie. And also I've seen from the creator who is the same guy that did the manga, the who said it was like Blade Runner was a big influence. So he was taking in some of that cyberpunk thing, thing which is always this like dystopic. Well, it's taking a look at it. I think it crusher. it's yeah. The boot is stepping on your head and your head's in the mud. Yeah. Related to all the gangs and, and the, the cyberpunk and all of that stuff. Uh, I thought it was kind of funny that the Yakuza just seemed to have disappeared from the world. I guess they were all killed in World War Three or something like that. I mean, the Yakuza are uh, currently the largest gang in Japan. And it's not even like they are they are just behind the scenes. Like they are they have businesses, they have offices. Uh, you know, they they operate quite out in the open. But we don't see any of that in the movie at all. It's just kind of these biker gangs and the military and then citizens who are rioting because they want to I don't know, overthrow the authoritarian regime. A note that I'll put in the show notes, there's a podcast uh, the History of Japan podcast by Isaac Meyer, which has a series of episodes dedicated to explaining how the Yakuza came to be and how they went through World War II and everything up to the present day. But he spent like several episodes, which is several hours, talking about this very topic, and it was really cool, and it's way more than we could or need to address here. So I'm going to put a link in the show notes, FYI. If you ever do decipher history, you can talk about Akira. With, maybe we can get Isaac Meyer on. That's a really good idea. Oh, wait, dude, the, that doesn't make sense. There's no, there's no Yakuza here. <laughs> that was our thing to get to this topic was like there aren't any in it they were all killed in the nuclear annihilation it's funny how like they built this neo tokyo thing in the movie neo tokyo is here it's this cyberpunk sort of city deal and the uh author creator director dude also said like he took inspiration from blade runner and romancer the original movies that established the cyberpunk aesthetic and then how this movie came back it like jumps from East influencing West because all the stuff in the original cyberpunk is all Asian weird. And then it jumps back across. And then the dude making this movie is digesting it back in in the other direction. Cross pollination. Yeah. And then there's these other innovations in the idea that weren't there in the originals, I guess. Because like the iconic images of this movie, I think the the most glaring examples would be the motorcycle stuff. The motor Because it's right in the opening too. The motorcycle chase scenes. But you can see the connection here because they are talking about their bikes in like a gearhead way. And they look really badass and futuristic. Although it's not Tron Hubless and it's not electric. Are they not electric? Probably not, right? It doesn't seem that way. I mean, he's revving it up so it has an alternator to charge the laser gun. No, no, no. I want my future bike to be like rrr, 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 for no reason, even if it's electric. But yeah, I mean, having the sound is probably a large part of it, especially if you're young and a gang. And a jerk. And a jerk. Yes, but that's where all the torque is. But he does have a, a super that bike. I think he said he had 200 and something horsepower. That'll get you going pretty fast. We had to look this up because I have no concept of like how many horsepower is a lot. That's a lot. But that's a <laughs> lot. Especially on a bike. <laughs> that's something that weighs 400 pounds. Yeah, that's like that's apparently what some of the very highest end motorcycles were up around 200, right? Two to 300. And that yeah, that's pushing it. But that'll get you a couple hundred miles an hour. Now put that with a pipe and hitting someone in the face while you're riding by. And then also going flying off of it because that's what happens to Tetsuro. Uh, he runs into the little psychic boy and stops immediately via explosion. <clears throat> he definitely would have his insides jiggled about. There would kind of be mush water, I think. Jiggled about. I'd be worrying more about his cranium, but yeah, yeah. He'd be a lot of mush water left over. <laughs> These are technical medical terms, I can tell. That's my <laughs> issue with the motorcycle. You were in an accident. You've got moisture water now. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, your organs are mush water. Imagine the doctor looking at the X-rays like on a, on a chart. Oh no, 
<laughs> Scratches his chin. It's a secure, severe case of mush water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's the prognosis, Doc? Motorcycles do seem dangerous. Like, I wouldn't want... Only if you crash. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Free solo climbing is only dangerous if you fall. Yeah, pretty much. You might be asking, where does the term horsepower come from? Because I was. It's not... Real... Actually, you know a horse actually provides more than one horsepower? Wait, what? Yeah. It's, it, it doesn't match up. Like... Oh, that's trash. <laughs> <laughs> My world is upside down now. It's kind of how like a foot doesn't actually measure the same length as my foot. Very misleading. Yeah, but your feet are super tiny. Yeah, well, we still we shouldn't call it a foot then. I saw your feet a little. They weren't that big. <laughs> <laughs> it's about one foot long. <laughs> uh, but the so horsepower is... is, you know, it makes sense though, because the horsepower as established was basically a marketing term. It was like James Watt comes up with his steam engine. And it was a really important, good steam engine. It was a change the world. Great stuff. But in order Replace to Replace one horse is what he was trying to sell it as. No, no, no. It was even better. He was like, well, the alternative to my steam engine is this dumbass horse. So I'm going to measure how much a horse can produce. Well, no, I'm going to I'm going to measure some things about the horse and then kind of make up some math about it at the end. And I'm going to say that this is one horsepower of force. Kind of like it, if I electrocute this thing with electricity, <laughs> it's inherently dangerous. No, no. It was a steam engine, Colbert. So his steam engine... <laughs> It was it was like thirty five horsepower or whatever the original, so you know like it's like a lawnmower or whatever, not that much, but what kind original of lawnmowers do you have that are thirty five horsepower? <laughs> I have no idea how many horsepower a lawnmower. <laughs> Jeez, man! So it's like a Roomba, <laughs> right? Right? Is that a Roomba? <laughs> do you have a pull start on your Roomba? <laughs> <laughs> like I was saying, I have no concept of how many horsepower is a lot of horsepower. And who knows how many fathoms? How many grass are you cutting? Jeez. <laughs> how many Roomba units does your car put out or whatever? <laughs> you can do whatever you want. That's what he did. James Watt just made it up. So I'm just wondering, like, what kind of marketing term measurement could we be like? We're the best podcast because we have 900 of these. Oh, I got it. We're the best podcast because we have one Jolene supporter. And on the show, we just have a Jolene. We have a Jolene. There it's you our, go. Yeah. That's our unit of success measurement. One theoretical Jolene. The canonical Jolene. <laughs> uh, there's some other technologies that are also kind of fit the futuristic genre. They have uh, sideways slidey freight elevators, for example, in Neo Tokyo, which is neat. That's, that's the most important technology to have in your science fiction setting. <laughs> <laughs> you have like flying motorcycles and then the ooh elevators that go. Ooh, that's a big elevator. Sideways. You know what? I was impressed. I don't have a sideways elevator in my house, so. If you need a set piece, I mean that stands out. Giant moving platform into secret facility. I'm seeing that more as like military secret facility vibes in sci-fi. It's much but better yes. than just this long elevator that you can't see. Imagine the, a yeah. box that you think <laughs> is moving. Imagine the shot, though, and how much worse it would be if it's just a bunch of the people standing together, not looking at each other, and facing the one wall while talking and expositing. Being uncomfortable. Yeah, that's it. This it, is a giant platform. Giant moving platform. That's where it's at. When I think of this, the first thing I think of is the first couple levels of Half-Life. Do you remember that? That was a big... I don't know. That was a monorail, or wasn't it? No, no. That, oh, that was before the you actually get into the gameplay. Yeah, yeah. You're in a monorail. But early on in the game, you're going through the facility... And you go down one of these sweet elevators, and a bunch of head crabs slide down the huge wall to come at you. This is a sort of elevator. I mean, it makes sense for the context because they're an underground military facility. This is the elevator you would use to move your tanks up and down through storage or whatever. Huge. Other games? I'm also pretty sure it was in one of the Ninja Trolls arcade games. I can't remember which. Like the original arcade ones, if you could recall. Oh, wait. No, I think I vaguely, vaguely remember those. Good job, Jolene. That's all I have to contribute. Oh, that's it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I, no, in the video games. I don't know where I'm supposed to go with that. Yeah, no, no. I love, uh, I miss the Simpsons video game, too. That oh, didn't have any funiculars. That's the word, by the way. Did you look up funicular video game turtle? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> I'm not surprised the results were less than surprising. Stellar. Yeah. Were less than uh, fulfilling. Yeah. Um, it's called a funicular, but it's not just for elevators. It's uh, funicular is just the word. To, platform. Typically on a hill or mountainside that goes up. It doesn't just have to be a platform, though. Apparently, that's also the word for, like, the mountainside trams. Yep. Because the word funicular apparently is Latin. It's just cord. So something that's getting... It's, I'm, technically, any elevator is pulled by cord. So I'm not sure why we don't just use this word for everything. Not everything, but elevators in general. 
we had some contention in the past. I'm not sure if it made it into the show, but we had a whole thing where we were trying to figure out. Oh, no, you said the word umbilicus. I did. And we got it confused with funiculus. So, fin- language. Funicular <laughs> is Latin for cord, and we use it to refer to slidey elevator type contraption. Funiculus is an umbilical cord, and umbilicus is an able. Don't get them confused. You'll look like a fool on the podcast one day. You'll sound like a fool. You can't look like a fool on the podcast. We found out that these funiculars just lead down to these underground rivers. Yeah, they do spend a lot of time in the uh, the rivers and the sewers. Which I so in Tokyo, there's a bunch of different rivers. There's one that's, it, the rivers that they end up spending a lot of their time in look a lot like the Maguro River, but that has really really steep sides. I mean, if you think about it, they're not just going to have like I don't know rivers you can run down in and like hang out and then like come back out of in the middle of a city that's you know impractical people would be doing it all the time it's not very good so like you could not be able to get out of the sides and then there's also the Sumida river but that's like a huge huge wide river so i think that in the nuclear war or whatever apocalypse happened that destroyed tokyo or most of tokyo they must have also drastically changed the water systems because that is not how modern tokyo looks at all I don't remember any rivers in this movie. They seriously spent like half their time in various types of water. Are you conflating river and sewage? Because I saw lots of sewage. And lots and lots of dirty, dirty canals. They did have sewers, though, and they were huge. Is that how sewers look? (laughs) Oh, they actually, I know this because I looked it up. Um, Before the 1964 Olympics, they uh, had really outdated sewage systems that rely on vacuum systems in order to remove the waste. And one of the main projects that they did for the Olympics was to upgrade all of the toilets and sewer systems and modernize them so that they didn't rely on big trucks that came in and vacuumed all of the vacuumed all the waste out. Oh, that was that sounds that doesn't scale well probably. I know it doesn't, not at all. So they do actually, but that's why. So there's a ton of controversy around the 1964 Tokyo Olympics because it created a nightmare for the people living in the city and they spent tons and tons and tons of money modernizing it. But ultimately, their infrastructure is is fantastic. Uh, I mean, they have public restrooms everywhere, which seems like a very simple thing. But if you spend a lot of time walking around New York where there's basically none, it becomes kind of an issue. Um, anyway, so they do they do have like tons of, of bathrooms and sewage systems everywhere, and it's it's fairly modern. Same thing for uh, all the trains, the um, Shinkansen, the bullet trains. They were built specifically for the 1964 Olympics, and that's still how most people get around Japan. So all these damn public restrooms. That's why they need these humongous sewers. Well, I was thinking because they have so many. If you had to ration it like gas, where you can only poop on alternating days, <laughs> you're probably going to fix that very quickly. <laughs> oh, because your capacity to remove the poop is so limited. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, if they were running around in sewers, which wasn't 100 percent clear to me, but let's just go. It looked with that. pretty bad. They, there should have been more vomiting and uh, dysentery. I feel like in this movie. Maybe we didn't have time enough to see their bacterial infections manifest. In a fever. <laughs> they just have like styes everywhere. <laughs> I mean, there were dead rats floating in that. With maggots. And people, yeah. Yeah. Although, why would the sewers empty out into your military facility that's underground? Did it spill? Yeah, it was just a giant waterfall of sewage. Apparently, anything that featured water in this movie, I just wasn't looking because I don't remember that either. It, it helps highlight how gross parts of the city are because you contrast it to there were giant, massive skyscrapers. Yeah, it's full of lights and it looks pretty from a distance and then the ground is dirty and just full of rubble and debris. I guess that's like basically all the all that Tokyo is really on the bottom floor is just sewage. Sewage, yeah. <laughs> nice place. Neo Tokyo. Also, when they are in the sewage systems, that's the first time that we see the motorcycle slash hovercraft slash whatever that is. That's something that drives me nuts when we see it in the movie sometimes. Where there's something like anti gravity, and it's like, yeah, we use it for motorcycles; they just float. But like everything else in the world that would be changed by that technology, just isn't different. 
if you put it in the context of the powers that we see Akira and Tetsuro display, where they're able to levitate objects and do all of that, maybe, hypothesis, what they're actually doing is manipulating gravity. Uh, at one point in the movie, the doctor does say that um, he's reading from Tetsuro proton decay and quote particles that are unknown to science maybe those are the mystical you know gravitons which allow you to also turn off gravity yeah yeah i mean that's I, that's a stretch but. you should trust him because it was albert einstein yeah he looked like he knew what he was doing he had yeah. a lab coat if he says something it's probably true i think you're probably on the right track i think we saw like sort of jet propulsion floaty sci-fi vehicles but we do see at least one example of like there are the ESP wrinkly children in the movie, that feature, and they have mind powers. And we do see what appears to be like the elder of them floating around in a very quiet floaty chair. And I think that one probably is probably something to do with his mind powers. Although, like, why not just pick up yourself instead of sitting in a chair and picking it up? Because he wants to sit. I feel like you're, but what if you he gets sit? tired of mind powering his chair around, then he has a chair to sit in. Oh, right. So when he stops, he's sitting in a chair. <laughs> it's like the failure mode for an escalator is stairs. The failure mode for my floaty chair is, is chair. chair. <laughs> now I'm comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Although if we're trying to explain it from a science perspective, that does make sense if these children with psychic abilities are ultimately have them because of some new particle that's unknown to science, then there's no reason why you couldn't harness that and store it in bikes and stuff like that for specific purposes. And it would also kind of make sense if those powers are coming from these I don't know, new particles that are unknown to physics, uh, the drugs are able to suppress them because that's what the military people are ultimately, I think, doing to the kids and trying to do to Titsuro is give them this medication that suppresses their abilities. It has to, it has to be something like that we can interact with if we're able to, you know, use drugs to suppress it. So perhaps it's, it's just this energy that we can harness to some degree and also suppress to some, to some degree. I was going to say, they're the ones that initially created Akira, correct? Yes. This wasn't just some fluke. Yeah, they created him. That's yeah. why they were so concerned about it happening again. Just, you, you've you heard of like the men that stare at coats, where real U.S. government programs really did research into size stuff, because, well, like, why not, I guess, right? That would be really useful if you could do mind bullets, or read someone's mind from over there, or levitate a chair. So oh, yeah, you see across the world. Yeah, all those things, really cool. So I'm down with the research happening. But imagine if instead of nothing at all coming from it, you got like New York exploded. You would be afraid to let that get out of hand in the future. But you also can help. You might wonder like why they do it again if it was so bad. But you also can't help but develop that technology. It's another analogy to, nuclear, to the nuclear bomb. You can't let the other guy get it first without you also having it. And they did create the four of them. So the three kids were created at the same time as Akira, roughly. Yeah. They're like, hey, that guy, I'm going to chop him up and freeze him, figure out what to do later. So the kid created a big singularity type energy blast, Akira did at the start of the movie. And yeah, his body just was, was still there and he let people chop him up into little pieces. He didn't need his parts anymore, Jolene. Oh, okay. So like maybe his brain just went somewhere else and his body was left. That actually makes sense. I was thinking that his, his information was elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, that's so what I speak. meant. Sorry, yeah. I, I said brain, but consciousness is probably a better word. So his consciousness laughed and created this big, you know, energy blast, but his body was left behind. Yeah, that makes sense. So real quick, movie opens with the explosion. We never actually went to the explanation part. The deal seems to be, because it is a little confusing, chronologically, government starts a program to do sci research for kids with mind bullets. They produce some kids that can do mind bullets. One of them does a really big mind bullet and explodes Tokyo. This research is ongoing. And when they get their hands on Tetsuo, one of the characters in the film, they do it to him too. And he takes to it in a manner that he has a very quick takeoff and ability and gets out of hand and gets away. Doesn't and that leads to what? Doesn't take his drugs. That See, you got to take your drugs. Good for health, bad for education. And that leads to the final conflict of the film where our, I guess our main, main, our main guy, Kaneda, has to face off against Tetsuo whose powers have grown out of hand and he's gone crazy and he's like... You know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. One of, one of those deals. I definitely think that whatever this thing is, 
it's not just the power that corrupts you because the little kids also act in ways that I would argue display certain levels of insanity. So we have this whole weird bear running around spewing milk out of all of its orifices scene. And it turns out that this isn't just a hallucination that Tetsuro is having. It's the three little kids who have entered his mind and are forcing him to see all of these terrifying hallucinations. Immediately after that scene, they say, oh, you know, we need to control you. You need to suppress the psychic abilities and not use them or you could destroy the world. Why would you send terrifying hallucinations to someone who might destroy everything on the planet? Unless you are insane and incapable of, of basic forms of reason and logic. Yeah, but most little kids will have mind powers. Maybe that's how they play. Like, look at this sweet milk bear. <laughs> and it's like, oh, yeah, look at this sweet milk rabbit. <laughs> Different things that leak milk. <laughs> you like milk, right? Yeah, sure. Let's mix that with a bear. <laughs> Woo, milk party. <laughs> now, and so Akira was one of those kids who we don't know if he cracked under the pressure at any point, but he did some, whatever it was that happened, he blew up and went away to like another plane or something maybe. In the movie, they describe it a couple different ways. Ultimate energy, I'm putting up finger quotes all these. They said it was the source of our knowledge and energy. And the girl who may not know anything was describing it as like, what about the Industrial Revolution and human evolution and all the things that ever happened came from the power of Akira or whatever? Well, I think it was the power inside of us. The power, well, yeah, okay. The same source as the power from Akira, which I guess what they say is that it was inside us all along type deal. Yeah, basically, I think the idea there, which is... Is that during the birth of the universe, there's all this just as genetic material that has existed, you know, since the beginning of time, the beginning of everything. And that is what contains knowledge and reason. And basically what we know is, is consciousness. Uh, and, and that somehow gets activated, I guess. But to the evolution point, uh, when the girls talk about how it's the next stage of evolution, fun fact, evolution does not take place in stages it is simply successive changes that take place over generations so each new generation is is going through evolution it's it's a constant process it's not like oh you reach a plateau and this is now suddenly the next stage of evolution oh pop out goes an arm or so you're saying i can't just like unlock my potential for mind bullets yeah that's literally not how evolution works and i always think it's funny too that if it's something good, it's the next stage of evolution. And that's what everyone says, or it could be. If it's something bad, oh, no, it's not supposed to. It's not the next stage of evolution. Like, maybe the thing that happens instead of getting superpowers is oh, your head explodes. Maybe the next stage of evolution is just exploding heads. That's, that doesn't sound as fun. That doesn't seem adaptive. I would like to think. Like mind bullets. I can get that one. Well, a little bit more the uh, guided evolution is that you can select that I don't want my head to explode. I want mind bullets, and that's good. <clears throat> but also uh, comparing the amoeba to the human is you can kind of view it like milestones is, you know, we've gained intelligence and the level to which we can alter the world around us is exponentially different. It's so vastly different that you know, the amoeba doesn't comprehend what we can do. Kind of like if you look at Q in Star Trek. His existence is wildly different from that of a human, kind of uplifting, if you will. That I mean, that's sort of what I at least see in the ending of the movie is Tutsuro gets all this power and basically leaves the universe, enters another dimension, starts his own Big Bang and propagates another universe with perhaps all of the seeds of his intelligence. And then this just repeats ad infinitum on and on and on as it becomes activated in random people and they leave their universes. And so the story goes. All right, cool. So how do I get, how do I get that? Can you not do it near me? How do I unlock? <laughs> it's pretty dangerous for everyone around you. Apparently a big bang only takes out half a city. So you're, you're probably good if I could just, but you need like a designated big bang zone. The unlocking the latent power to this degree not not so believable, but like, and evolution doesn't go in stages or have an endpoint or direction in general. However, we do have stuff that that does actually make sense. The idea of unlocking something that is in our genetic code, 
that we're not using, so to speak, phenotypically. I also find it more plausible if we're going with the idea of guided evolution. Uh, I mean, you know, we're kind of doing it with, with CRISPR and, and so on, or at least starting to do it, gene editing. If what these people in Japan are doing, this military complex, is um, creating changes, but just in one organism, as opposed to, you know, successive changes over generations, maybe we could see it as some type of, well, not evolution. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, evolution by by uh, artificial selection still counts. The mechanism is the thing that's changing. And like that, that unlocking of latent code is atavism is the word in biology. And that's how like we've done, we've seen researchers, we talked about before researchers taking a chicken and turning on certain like dinosaur traits, you know, like they get different claws, their beak is different or, uh, oh, and the one they like turned on the genes for teeth. Yeah. And then you get murder beak and you get murder beak. And that's a thing like that. You have to go real far back in the bird's history to get to teeth again. So like those things can be there for some time. But even like more mundane things in humans, there are like that we might be familiar with. There are states that most of the population doesn't have this thing anymore, but there's a latent gene that could be turned on or the one that's blocking it could be turned off or whatever the situation. And you get things like colorblindness or a vestigial tail, like a, or, or actually what's the word for it? There's like the false tail and then there's like the fucking you have a real tail off the end of your spine. I can't remember what the difference is. There's a name. Both of those things sound awful. Like, all right, we can <laughs> we can edit you to like make you colorblind or give you a tail that pokes a lot when you're trying I'm saying, to say no, no don't edit tail. people to do that. That's terrible. But these are things that happen just by like random chance mutation. And we we get some people, more men in the case of colorblindness, or some people get a tail, or whatever number of other things that have generally like gone away that are sort of still unlockable. None of these are mind bullets that can explode a city, but Atavism is pretty cool, and we can even use it to our advantage and make murder chickens or whatever. That kind of seems eventually. like we had these uplifted beings that became us at some point in time, because it seems like homeopathy. Then there's just memories floating around. To offer a cool example, which I don't know if this is even remotely possible or where this emerged in our story of human evolution, uh, but if you could activate a gene to give, like you know, you webbing, and you could you could like have webbed fingers, that would be handy, huh? Like yes. Ducks. So way back in our history. Our ancestors had webby stuff. Now, I don't know if that was still be left around, but if that was left around and findable and we could like turn it on or turn off the thing that blocked it and get some webs, why not? Sure. I want to be a super swimmer. Probably do it wrong and end up like with a web between like, I don't know, your forehead and your knee. That would suck. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big old web. <laughs> I mean, you can get like bat lats. Atavism. But in the movie... They just turn on his latent ability to like shoot mind bullets or whatever. And it's pretty bad. He takes to it more than everybody else, in fact. So he's like got super duper superpowers. And they're shooting him with like, they shoot him with laser guns. They try to. They shoot him with all kinds of stuff and they just can't. Like it doesn't work. Oh, and then he did um, the laser that is based in space, I believe, is what ultimately shot off his arm, correct? Anyway, at one point, he gets his arm shot off. I thought it was by the big space laser, but maybe I'm mistaken. I think Canada might have done it. Whatever. They have like mundane. I don't know. It's actually not that mundane. They have laser rifles, which are pretty badass, but they do bring in the big guns at one point because it's not going well. And they need like the orbital laser murder cannon. I believe I heard before. I need to fact check this, but we had technology like laser technology that was meant to blind adversaries. And there was some treaty that was signed that some convention that made them illegal because, you know, they caused permanent blindness. That explains the evolution of these technologies, because if you can't do blinding lasers, you do the laser that burns somebody up with doom and death. It's like you step past the blinding and just like obliterate the entire body with an orbital cannon. Yeah, but to be honest, if I was like, you know, charging into battle and I had a choice between getting shot in my tummy tum or, I don't know, blinded, I'd, I'd probably definitely choose blinding or like my arm blown off or something like that. Well, I think it's just going to be blinded and then murdered. They're not just like blind you and they're like, oh, look, you're blinded. <laughs> Sucks for you. And just walk past you. 
Uh, or then maybe if you had like a bunch of blind people fighting in the army, they would just like, you know, open fire and then they just like shoot all their comrades and it would just, you know, be chaos and more people would die. I don't think you usually put the blind people back on the battlefield with a gun. <laughs> no, <laughs> this way. Like, no, that way. You're, you're, you would be in battle when you get blinded, Chris. Oh, okay. And so then you would just open fire, not like go back and get like, I don't know, <laughs> an, a fancy eye patch and get sent out. They put like a white eye patch across, draw eyes on it so the enemy can't tell. He never blinks. S- spin you He's around fearless. three times and push you back in. <laughs> it's like pin the tail on the donkey. <laughs> No, that's dumb. That's terrible. Let's not have those. What we do need is space lasers. Do we, though? Do we? Because they sound kind of awful. Uh, Fun fact, during World War II, Hitler's Germany was investigating something called a sun gun, which would use enormous concave mirrors to not shoot like a laser, but to basically take the sun's beams and use it to vaporize large parts of the Earth, like cities. Um, and there was some discussion and I I think they said that they could build one in like 50 to a hundred years. To my knowledge, it's not something that is currently being discussed as any type of sun gun, but it's been 50 to a hundred years. So maybe we could build one now. We reinvestigated. That is something we wind up talking about nowadays for space settlement technology as like a solar collector. But you could just as easily, I suppose, burn some cities. This was really not that big either. So this wasn't, this definitely wasn't a solar collector. It was a like satellite sized satellite, actually a really big one, but it was, it was just like a laser. It's also a much better idea, I think, than a sun gun because a sun gun would cause devastation, devastation to local habitats, you know, like climate change and and all that stuff. I imagine it would not be good. Yeah, but you kill your enemies. Using the power of the sun. Tent also many of your many of your allies. <laughs> That's because there's a level of infeasibility about orbital cannons that are well, orbital laser cannons firing on ground targets. It tends to be a lot of atmosphere that gets in the way. Yeah. And then if there's dust, that's even worse, or clouds, because well, you know, water doesn't work too well because tends to tends to turn to gas. Um, there are plans, though, for a space-based laser, or at least there are there's a theory, hypothesis about how we, we could create one, but it would be used to destroy space junk, not to um, destroy anything on Earth. That was mentioned in the recent Kurtzkazak video, which I guess show notes for that, too, because that was really good. But yeah, there's all kinds of big stuff we wanted to orbit before it breaks into a lot of little stuff. So let's, let's push it with a laser, because you're right, the atmosphere is a big problem. As far as where that would need to be based, uh, I believe the idea is to have the laser satellite somewhere in low Earth orbit. Um, And low Earth orbit is about 2,000 kilometers or 1,200 miles from the Earth, whereas most of the um, satellites and and things like that are, are about kilometers or 370 miles from the earth those are the sun synchronous satellites the end i think you have a range of options if you just want to shove it into unstable orbit so it can burn up in the atmosphere just so it doesn't stay there for 100 years getting in your way that would be really polite of them to do also as opposed to the like i'm going to shoot a missile up and blow my satellite up type thing and then you have a bunch more pieces of garbage in like actual satellite path. I was thinking you like you push the small pieces into decaying orbits. That's what you're talking about, right? Just pushing the small like the the small pieces into decaying orbits, right? Not the cuz the large stuff we could just like fly like they just did in uh well, the Chinese space station, right? Fly it into the atmosphere, have it burn up. Ta-da. Yes. But then there's all these little pieces left, so you got to push the remaining bits. Yeah. Well, it depends if you have control of it or not. And also large and small is kind of relative cuz even I'm looking for a small object. Even something as small as my really fashionable eyebrow ring that I don't wear was uh, like this with the energies we're talking about in orbit would be enough to punch a giant hole through a space station and be really dangerous for whatever hardware you have up there. Explosive hardware. It'd be dangerous for hardware if it hit the International Space Station. If it went through the International Space Station, you would have like a little tiny, tiny, tiny explosive like decompression situation. That wouldn't be very fun at all for the living humans on board either, I dare say. Oh, I'm not even worried about the humans, although they're a thing. 
I just mean like oh, the replaceable Jolene. <laughs> no, I mean we have one ISS, but we have thousands of satellites that are really important. Replaceable. And the fear is of the cascade <laughs> because we're building more and more garbage up there from more and stuff break more and more stuff breaking up. We already do have um, laser technology that operates on, on Earth. Um, the military defense agency. Uh, we have well, there's the laser weapon system called Laws, I believe, or something like that. Laws. Um, there you go. Uh, it's thirty thousand watts or thirty kilowatts, and it's just used to fry sensors and you know bring down missiles and stuff like that. But the military defense agency is at least doing research on a five hundred kilowatt laser. So for comparison, as I said, the other one is just thirty thousand watts. Wait, this would be five hundred kilowatts. So. And then a megawatt one also. One megawatt is in the mix. Okay. These are so much nicer than the orbital laser that destroys things on the surface. It's a defensive one. This other one over here we can use to destroy space junk, make us all safer. What I recall most of this movie is that whole end scene <laughs> with like the giant blobby monster and Tetsuo. And Tetsuo getting Tetsuo! all like, I can't, like, I can't help Ta-da-da! me. Help me. Cut it up. That's the part, though, right? <laughs> it's I can't I can't control this anymore. Help me, and I'm losing my control. And the he turns poking into him full of laser monster. holes. I remember he was full. Of laser. I remember watching it as a kid and having like no idea how he got here or what the hell was happening. But it was like that's awesome, and it is. That was not that I thought that was going to give me nightmares. What? He's all like talking about how he's squishing his girlfriend to death, and I can feel her pain. And I mean, it's an awful way to die, you know? Yeah. Mush near boyfriend's fleshy bits. Don't laugh at that, you sickos. That's the end of the movie. What'd we learn? I don't know. Don't get mushed in fleshy bits. It's an awful way to die. That's true. Uh, humans shouldn't try and dictate the course of evolution because when we do it, <laughs> goes kind of bad for us. There are already people doing it now. Disagree. <laughs> Well, that's what the movie says. I'm not saying that that's what I, you know, subscribe to. It's just I think that's what the movie's trying to teach us, you guys. You can reject it if you want. That's cool. Luddite Jolene doesn't want us to be <laughs> transhumans anymore. <laughs> no mind powers for you. Yeah, I'll take my mind bullets. I don't care. It's going to happen. Might as well might as well embrace it. Give me a cyborg arm and some laser cannons in my eyes. Like, to shoot the lasers. <laughs> I mean, no. Miniature laser cannons, or do your head get much bigger? No, no. Yeah, dude, technology. I mean, Miniaturization. Cannon implies, like, certain scope. Yeah, I guess. Can't just call anything a cannon. Yep. That's movie. Akira is sweet. And it is gorgeous. And I'm glad we watched Akira again. Because, you know what? It did make more sense this time than when I was 10. And you, Julie never saw it before, but she would have had the same problem. The same experience, I'm sure. I don't know. I was a very smart little girl. I might have understood it. Man, man, man. <laughs> recommended related stuff. Yeah, Jolie, you're great. Recommended related stuff. There was a nerd writer video. He makes good videos. He's smart. He's smart. He made a video about Akira, how to animate light, as it was called. And it's about the art of Akira. It's good. Also, hey, follow Decipher Sci Fi on social media. How about that? We have YouTube. No, that's not what I meant. We do. We have Twitter. We got Instagram. There's Facebook. Wherever the place is, there's a Decipher Sci Fi. And right now, we're we're publishing almost every day. Like an animated sci-fi movie poster thing. So check it out. It might be cool. It might also be bad. But like it's an excuse for me to practice compositing video stuff. No, I saw that. It was really good. I saw at least one of them anyway. I can't remember what one it was now, but I approve. I'm so good it stuck with her. It was, yeah, I feel like maybe that wasn't entirely <laughs> genuine. <laughs> oh, yeah, I saw one of them. Say so it was uh, it the was poster. The one with the yeah, it was, yeah, it was a good thing. Yeah, I was yeah. walking off into the sunset. It was like a dude and there was like a sunset and he was like kind of walking. Also, there's Jolene. She's kind of a bad person. But what are you doing on the internet these days? Oh, I'm a science writer, so I'm doing that in various places. Uh, Where would you point people to nowadays? Uh, uh, science Alert. And then mostly I'm uh, writing for the Future of Life, which is a organization, nonprofit organization, that funds research and initiatives into various things that are trying to make life happy and beneficial and ensure that technology doesn't destroy us. So they fund AI researchers and initiatives related to nuclear disarmament, um, CRISPR gene editing, stuff like that. So Jolene, those places, I'll link it in the show notes, all those things. The NerdWriter video, our social things, and Jolene's recent writing activity. Jolene is a good role model. 
She supports her creators online. I don't know about creators, but us. That's what's important. And everybody should know that we have Decipher RPG coming up. And everybody that's a supporter of the show by Friday, December 21st, we're going to use their name as a character in the new show. You know we're going to have a good one for Jolene. She might be a giant robotic milk spewing patchwork teddy bear. A unicorn nano swarm. Or maybe an unfortunate human getting squished in some fleshy bits. The possibilities are endless, and I'm sure we'll run into all kinds of hijinks and opportunities for characters in the show. So that's coming up pretty soon, and anybody who is supporting the show will get in on that. So be like Jolene and support the show. Decipherscipe.com slash support the show. And not just Jolene, I should note. Here's everybody else who's supporting the show. Terrence Lee, Joe Ferraro, Daniel the Eplander, Jeremy the Top Poster, Adrian Mihaila, Dinosaur Hunter, Alan Michael Pools, Super Saiyan Superman, Robert Roaster, and new person Adam Piper. He came to us from LSG. I don't know much about Adam Piper yet. Seems like a fine, upstanding individual. Delinco Street, Hood, Adam Piper. And Dean from LSG Media. Also, Andy B. of Bash 25 Comics. Brian the Sexiest Brother Peterson. Andrew Capitulo of the Mighty. Jeff Farmer Schwartman. Laser Nipples Chris Kennard. How do you feel about laser nipples? I don't understand what those are. Laser Cannon kind of Nipples Chris Kennard. <laughs> Checks out. <laughs> Pew, pew. <laughs> That's like awesome powers of the fembots. Yes. I wouldn't say those were cannons, Colbert. Not everything that shoots something is a cannon. And Michael, the giantess Peterson. Samuel Mumby, Igor Smolinski, Josh Heaven G of LSG Media, Mr. Reagan Curly Phil, Tema Sigma, his arms wide, John Wares, who actually sent me an email telling me about how to pronounce his name, and I don't remember. I think he's working his way chronologically through the podcast as well. So he's in for a rude awakening when he realizes we just spent the past two months saying his name wrong. <laughs> what are you going to do? Weird Leaky Milk Rabbit, Matt Greek, Joe Ruppler, Kobe FF, Waifu Pillow, Donnie Migliori. What would be called a husband do or whatever? Whatever the opposite <laughs> of a waifu is, isn't it? I seem to wind up talking to Donnie about video games somewhat often, coincidentally. So I'm going to share a tidbit. There was an Akira video game for the NES. Well, no, see, not for the NES. There was an Akira video game for the Famicom in Japan, and it never made it over. So you probably missed it if you're not from Japan. However, due to the magic of the internet, if you're the sort of person who gets ROMs for things, or even better, if you're the sort of person who dumps his old cartridges that he bought online legitimately, and then applies patches to translate the text, you could totally do that for this game and play it in English. Reportedly, it's not very good, but it's Akira. But like we're appreciating the fan subbers back in the day who would actually be the only source of English language translation for a bunch of old anime. Here we are where a game that never in game land was something that never was going to see the light of day in English. Thank you, Internet. And sometimes it's a lot of work because the nature of the way the Nintendo files are packed in, there has to be some cleverness in and the way that things address direct memory spaces. I think I might be putting it the right way. There's actually a lot of work going into making things fit in the right spot without messing up the rest of the cartridge. So somebody out there is doing the Lord's work. Other people, we got Buggy or Luke Bailey, Naked and Clown Makeup Eli Avron, a Lark Dark and Goodham Superhero, Daniel James Barker of A Certainty Principle of the Podcast, A.G. Falcone of this podcast sometimes, and John, Champion of Iconic Bike Slide Beavers, Mustachioed Badass General DJ Moffat. That was actually, that guy, the general dude was like the one character I care for. Everyone else is horrible. I want to see a movie about that, dude. Not these punk kids. And my mom and Grandma Judy and Magical Milk Spewing. Magical Milk Spewing Patchwork Unicorn. Shut up, Colbert, with your words that come out <laughs> in one shot. I think you're so fancy. Why don't you slow down a little bit? And Magical Milk Spewing Patchwork. No. And Magical <laughs> Spewing. <laughs> and, and Magical Milk Spewing Patchwork Unicorn, Jolene Creighton. And that's the end of the show. Thank you, Jolene. Thank you. Goodbye, Jolene. I, I panicked. I didn't know what to say. What, usually people say goodbye or thank you. You say you're welcome and goodbye. It's not really. I mean, you could be like, Christopher, <laughs> and then shoot a laser at him. Okay. All right. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. Beep boop, intro music, welcome to Sci-Fi Sci-Fi. We explore how and why. I'm Christopher Peterson. Peterson. I'm Lee Kober. <laughs> hey Lee. Hey Chris. <laughs> we watched a movie. We did. <laughs> what did we watch? All right. You Keep can, going. You can... oh, it was Akira. <laughs>